virtually all RC car shocks from 10th scale to 8th scale follow the same basic architecture for one good reason. It works. And it's also very cost effective. There are literally thousands of patents for full-sized car, truck, moto, and bicycle shocks. You can easily spend $1,000 for a bicycle or moto shock and many thousands of dollars on car and truck shocks. RC car shocks are insanely simple, but they still deliver the massive variety of tuning that you need to perform perfectly. On this channel, we look at the science behind your grown-up toys. RC shocks are really tiny, and the physics behind full-size shocks simply doesn't scale easily to one-tenth the size. It's tough to wind springs, hold pressure, and control oil. On full-size shocks, you might have independent high-speed and low-speed compression damping circuits, jounce bumpers, preloaded shim stacks, floating pistons, nitrogen reservoirs, high-speed rebound catches, twin chambers, hydraulic bottom out, air assist, coil assist, negative springs, on and on and on. In RC, you pretty much have shocks with 17 parts, give or take. A single piston head with holes in it, a couple O-rings, a spring, and some oil. Nearly every single RC shock follows that basic template. This is an introductory video before we get deeper into more tuning topics. But even if you're a seasoned expert, I bet you'll learn at least one new thing here. Let's take a detailed look at tiny shock architecture. The purpose of shock absorbers are to isolate the chassis from the terrain and allow the wheels to maintain precise contact with the ground for traction and control. How do shocks do this? A shock controls the rate of movement of your suspension arms or axles, both in compression and extension or rebound, so you don't have undesirable oscillations, overstroke, or other erratic movements. It does this by converting linear motion into heat, believe it or not. When the piston moves, it creates higher pressure on one side of the piston, which in turn creates lower pressure on the opposite side. This forces oil to pass through small holes called ports on the piston head. Heat is generated from friction as oil is squeezed through these constricted holes. RC cars have so little mass that there is rarely a heat issue. For sure, never on a crawler. But that is the physics behind all shock absorbers. Let's start by looking at the shock from the outside. You're going to have spherical ends on both sides. That ensures that shock loads only go through the middle of the shaft and don't bend or side load the shock. Of course, there will be a coil spring. This is your shock body. This is generally called the spring cup or spring retainer. And this is the spring cap. Shocks should always have the ability to adjust the preload on the spring. Sometimes it might be down here on this end. I have an entire video on spring rate and preload. Higher end shocks will have a threaded collar and simpler shocks may just have these plastic collars that snap around the body. Check out that sick progressive wound spring. I see you Proline. Deluxe DravTech shocks, which are super popular with crawlers, are going to have O-rings on this end to adjust your preload. It's super simple and really clean. Now let's look inside. Just because something looks simple doesn't mean it's cheap or unsophisticated. One thing that I teach new engineers is that it's easy to over-engineer something, but actually much harder to deliberately design something simple. Many of the best ideas appear simple, but were really hard to think of. To me, the best ideas look so simple that people can't believe it didn't already exist. I call this assembly the seal stack. For starters, it's got at least one O-ring to keep the oil inside, but there's actually a lot more going on here that we will discuss later. This is the piston assembly. This is your oil, which will come in different viscosities or weights. That doesn't mean the weight or mass in grams. It means the thickness of the oil and how quickly or slowly it reacts. This is a rubber bladder. It separates the oil from an air chamber. This is air in here. This bladder 
allows the shock oil volume to expand as the shaft moves into it and displaces the oil. It also compensates for thermal expansion if your oil heats up. In full-scale shocks, this secondary chamber is more sophisticated than just a rubber bladder, but the concept is the same. Also on full-scale vehicles, this chamber will usually be pressurized with nitrogen, which means the oil is also pressurized, which helps fight cavitation, which is a topic for a more advanced video. Some shocks will have this flange that prevents the top cap from over-tightening against the bladder. On some other shocks, you may just have to be careful not to over-tighten the cap. This is the piston shaft. Part of it is outside the body and part of it is inside the body in the oil. It's connected to the piston head. Together they'd be called simply the piston. Your piston head is often attached to the piston shaft with E-clips or sometimes called C-clips. Nicer shocks will often have a nut or bolt holding the piston head on. I like this design better because sometimes the C-clip gets real close to the valving holes and it could affect the oil flow. This would be more common on smaller 10 millimeter crawler shocks. When you hear someone mention their shock size or bore size, they are referring to this internal diameter. Common 1 tenth scale diameters are 10, 12, 13, and 16. The larger the diameter, the more oil inside, and the larger diameter the piston head will be, which makes more space for tuning options. Smaller diameters are common on crawlers because they are more compact, and the shock fits in the chassis better under high articulation. This is the piston head. Different thicknesses, different sized holes, different number of holes, etc. The shape of this piston head combined with the oil weight is almost entirely responsible for your shock tune and performance. Now I'm not counting the angle of the shock mounted the chassis because that is external of the shock, but I do have an entire video on shock tuning with chassis mounting angle. Once I was working with Bob Fox, the founder of Fox Racing Shocks, that's the Fox tail logo. His brother founded Fox Racing, the clothing company, which is the head logo. I was in his office and on his wall he had this huge board and every single part of one of their latest shocks was all disassembled and tacked to this board. Even down to the single ball bearing that's used in the detent feel for the compression adjusters. And every single part had a price written next to it. There were probably 50 or 60 parts, maybe even 100. This was his way of visualizing exactly what his product cost and where they could do better. Now let's look at the seal stack. There's quite a bit going on here that you may not have realized. There will either be a quad ring, also called an X ring, or an O ring. You'll see both of them. Quad rings generally work better for dynamic or moving seals. It kind of looks like four O rings melted together. Quad rings generally seal better because they have more squish compared to a similarly sized O-ring. They are lower friction and part of that is because it traps oil in between the two seals. Because they're squishier, they also seal better at lower friction when the shaft bends or deflects against the seal. This seal kit is based on a common Traxxas design Team Associated uses O-rings. They both work well when built and deployed properly. Most companies are going to use this basic template that I'm about to explain. These two quad ring seals have four contact points with the shaft and they each do something slightly different. This is the wiper seal that keeps dirt on the outside and cleans the shaft on its way in. These two lips serve as grease seals to keep grease sealed in this area. And only this fourth lip here keeps oil in the body. You want to keep a good shock specific grease in this area, especially in these pockets. 
Sometimes people put grease on the outside when they assemble their shocks, which is fine. Just don't forget to put grease on the sliding surface. Oil should not leak into this grease chamber. There will be some sort of retaining ring to keep the entire seal stack in place. Common crawler shocks will have this circlip, which is kind of a pain to use. Other designs like this associated design might have a screw on cap or even a snap on plastic cap. Notice the flange right here for the shock cap to stop against to avoid crushing your bladder. These are really nice shocks associated, even though they only have O-rings here. Now you might think this is just a spacer, but it's actually called a backing ring or a backup ring, and it prevents extrusion of the O-ring. The gap between the ring and the housing is carefully engineered to prevent this extrusion. It's more important on high pressure chambers, but it does serve a similar purpose on RC cars. This is what extrusion looks like. Sometimes it's called an anti-extrusion ring. RC car shock pressures are usually quite low and this is rarely an issue. This is called the glide ring. It's actually a bushing, which is why it's common for it to be made out of white Delrin, which is known for its natural lubrication properties. What happens is your piston head and your glide ring work together in tandem to keep your shaft moving parallel to the shock body and to support any side loads. Full-scale shocks will follow the same basic principle. This is something called bushing overlap, and it's a concept shock engineers consider. It's the distance between the bushings, and it's an indication of the bending stiffness of the shock. Now, we've all seen bent shock shafts before. Despite having spherical joints at both ends of the shock, you can still get shaft buckling if it doesn't compress fast enough. And this is why you have two bushings. It's to support this shaft. Some shock shafts will come in this gold colored titanium nitride coating. Some will be just raw steel and some will have chrome plating. The best tie nitride shafts are going to have a really high polish mirrored finish. And you can get that super high polish finish both from chrome plating or titanium nitride. Titanium nitride is harder and will last longer. I always buy titanium nitride shafts. Okay, I know not all RC shocks are exactly the same, but there really are only a few options that deviate from this basic architecture that I've just explained. Here are a couple that come to mind. MIP bypass valves. These are really cool. This design starts to resemble full-scale shocks where you have a shim stack to better control the fluid flow. You can achieve different damping rates on compression and rebound with this type of shim stack. Emulsion caps are sometimes used in buggy racing. You leave a deliberate amount of air in the oil using this bleed port. There's no bladder and you have to follow a special process to get it right. There are pros and cons to this design and some people love them, some people hate them. There is this desert lizard shock that are very popular on crawlers because they have opposing springs on the inside. There's both a positive and a negative spring that allows you to set the ride height really deep into the travel. And the springs are on the inside, so it looks clean. Now that we know how an RC shock works and the parts that go into it, we can start to better understand what variables are available to tune with. Check out my other videos for shock tuning with mounting angle, oil weight, springs, and piston heads.